this is the first time in the history of the world that the communist government has been overthrown by the people. And for that, we congratulate you and the people of Guatemala for the support they have given. By the year 1944, Guatemala had been under the dictatorship of General Jorge Ubico for 13 years. He passed laws that favored the rich and discriminated against those in lower classes, mostly the indigenous Mayan communities. He constantly violated the right of free expression, repressing the scholars. But there remained the one class that was untouched by his might, the wealthy. During this time of despair, the intellectual class revolted against the government and forced Jorge Ubico and his successor into resignation. The rebellion was named the Revolución de Octubre, or the October Revolution. It gave start to a peaceful decade known as the Guatemalan Spring, establishing democracy. The first democratic election saw Juan José Arevalo Bermejo win, an educator and politician. In addition to investing in education, he created the Guatemalan Institute of Social Security, which provided the population with accessible and adequate health care. During this revolutionary administration, he drafted a new socialist constitution, which imposed a new tax over vacant land. Once Arevalo's period was over, a young ideological leader showed interest in running for office. Jacobo Arbenz, yet another revolutionary, motivated by the people, commenced his presidential campaign, promoting socio-economic equality and agrarian reform, thence convincing the voters. Propaganda política del candidato de las fuerzas revolucionarias y progresistas de Guatemala, Coronel Arbenz, prosigue con todo éxito. Más de 20.000 partidarios del Coronel Arbenz se congregan a escuchar la palabra de su candidato, al que esperan llevar con la fuerza del voto del pueblo a regir los más altos destinos de la nación. The vast majority of Guatemala was on his side, the main exceptions being the elite class and the United Fruit Company. The United Fruit Company, better known as the UFCO, was a banana producer and an exceptionally powerful company, especially in Guatemala. This company directly or indirectly controlled 40,000 jobs in Guatemala. Their investments went up to $60 million by the year of 1950 and had an amount of land compared to 259,000 farms of less than 10 acres. Their power was beyond economical. They could go over the president's head. They were their own rulers. To augment their profit, they consistently falsely reported that the land was worth one-tenth of the actual value to avoid taxes. On the 10th of November of 1950, Jacobo Arvens was elected president of the republic with 64.44% of the votes. He rapidly acted to fulfill the promises that he made to the people during his campaign. One of them was an agrarian reform, as only 2% of the population owned 70% of the arable land. It expropriated 1.5 million acres of land, 385,484 owned by the UFCO, and distributed it among 100,000 peasant families, with Arvens contributing 1,700 acres of his own state. The taken land would be paid back in a period of 38 years, and the families receiving it would have to pay 5% of their income to the government. The UFCO wanted about $16 million for the tracts. Guatemala offered the United Fruit own declared valuation for tax purposes, $627,572. Hence, infuriating the company to the point of having to consult Washington. The land reform was an attempt to break up this, this oligarchy, and it was very, very successful. It was done very professionally. There was a lot of, uh, there were legal proceedings. The U.S. government at the time was replete with individuals involved with the UFCO, the most prominent were the Secretary of State and the Director of the CIA, also known as the Dulles Brothers. Both have formerly worked in law firms that represented the UFCO, and they have big investments in it. They were determined to plot against Arvens. Given that Guatemala was implementing left-wing reforms and the Communist Party had access to the President, they believed it was a sign of Communism. They convinced the White House to help the CIA to overthrow Arvens' government. It was simple to get the means to do so from the US government because of the ongoing Cold War and fear of communism in the Western Hemisphere. Still many scholars like Steven Schlesinger argue that Arvins was not a communist, but rather a socialist. The threat uh, to the property of United Fruit Company. That was um, what caused the United Fruit Company to get the American government to overthrow Jacobo Arbenz. So they could remain in control of Guatemala's economy and make the money. 
Secretary of State John Foster Dulles was the first person to take action. Foster appointed a new ambassador of the U.S. to Guatemala, someone they could control, John Purifoy, an anti-communist radical. Before being an ambassador to Guatemala, he lived in Greece, where he helped to maintain capitalism. Purifoy warned the government about the harms of communism. President Arvins reacted strongly to the threat and refused to listen to Purifoy. When the news was reported back to Washington, Arvins' fate was sealed. He would need to be removed from power. The CIA decided that Arvins would be overthrown with psychological warfare, strategically designed for the uneducated Guatemalan population. Containing religious and twisted political factors, the psychological game would be the key to destroying Arvins. As Guatemalan when senior Mariano Rosell said, communism, atheist, and savage. Alan Dulles became the mastermind of the whole operation. Alan found the best face for the coup, Carlos Castillo Armas, Arvins' enemy. He had attempted to overthrow Arvins more than once and failed to do so. Returning from exile, Armas assembled, with the help of the CIA, an army of less than 200 poorly armed and trained soldiers. Those soldiers claimed to have been paid 300 US dollars in cash monthly. At the same time, Howard Hunt, a CIA agent with an affinity for propaganda, was creating La Voz de la Liberación, a radio station determined to convince all the population that Arvis' administration was communist and a threat to Guatemala and democracy. Atención Guatemala! Atención guatemaltecos! Radio Liberación en 6.360 kilociclos onda corta les habla. Esta es la emisora clandestina del Movimiento Libertador guatemalteco. Escúchenos usted y sabrá la realidad del momento político porque atraviesa Guatemala y los progresos irrefutables del gran Movimiento Libertador. Alan Dulles, in an attempt to speed up the overthrow, ordered flyers to be dropped around Guatemala City, containing a clear message, say no to communism. Shortly after, there were four bombings in Guatemala during two days. One of the bomber planes, model P-47S, not existing in any Latin American Air Force, filling Mexican land, and both of the pilots were identified as Americans. The planes couldn't be shut down given that Guatemala only owned six military aircrafts due to the six-year U.S. arms embargo. What Arvins feared was true. The U.S. was sponsoring the whole counter-revolution. The Guatemalan Minister of Foreign Affairs appealed to the UN Security Council. The council met on June the 20th of 1954 and responded by calling for the immediate termination of any action likely to cause bloodshed. They passed the case to the Organization of American States, who did not conduct any further investigation. The only entity that had supported Arvins turned their backs on him. The military once and for all retired from the battle. Many say that the soldiers wanted to keep their dignity, which would not have been possible if they confronted the United States. Feeling betrayed by his own people, Arvins entered a deep depression, in which he locked himself inside of his office. Finally, he resigned on June 27 of the year 1954, and openly blamed the U.S. government for forcing him to step down. Arvins Trying to keep the flame of the revolution alive, chose Enrique Diaz, the director of the Guatemalan Armed Forces, as his successor. There he stayed for less than 24 hours before the Dulles brothers intervened and forced his resignation. Castillo Armas arrived to Guatemala in the U.S. Embassy plane. He was received as a hero and instituted as the president of the Republic. Guatemala was once again under a complete dictatorship. From there on, the UFCA once again had complete control abolishing all decrees passed in a revolutionary decade. After being exiled, Arvins fled the country to Russia, the Czech Republic, and then to Cuba, where he spent the rest of his days in oblivion. He mysteriously died in a bathtub in Mexico in 1971. Castillo Armas was assassinated by a rival three years after his ascension to power, and they buried him as an idol. With time, the UFCO was consumed by their companies. It is now called Chiquita Banana. This political turmoil impacted Guatemala immensely, from stunting its economic growth to causing resentment between social classes. Such resentment led to armed uprisings, arguably the 36-year civil war in Guatemala, which led to 100,000 people dead, was an indirect outcome of the coup. Since then, the republic has remained unstable and underdeveloped, now being one of the poorest countries in Latin America. The 1954 coup d'etat, death of the Guatemalan Spring.